today as we come to the table. Not only did he not go right then, God gives him another 17 years. And I find it interesting, it was 17 years old when Joseph would disappear and was gone. And he thought about losing all these years. I've lost my son at 17 years old. I lost my son at 17. Now he gets back with his son and God gives him 17 more years with him. It's almost as if he's saying to him, you know, I'm going to make up all the years that you've lost. Although it was 20 some, there's something to me that was almost symbolic in the 17 years that God gave him in addition, because now he gets to spend those years catching up with Joseph and getting to know Joseph as a man. And at the same time, not only that, he gets to see his grandkids through Joseph. How encouraging is it to know that God is always at work in our lives, even when we don't understand the meaning? In today's teaching, Pastor Mark will walk listeners through the reunion between Jacob and his son Joseph. After many years separated, what joy Jacob must have felt to see his son again. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. For many Christ followers, it may be easy to look back over the course of life and see God's hand moving, even when we didn't know it. The Bible is filled with stories that speak of the Lord redeeming difficult situations. How can you put greater trust in Him today? You can rest in the truth that His ways are good. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 46 as he begins his message, Settling in Goshen. Uh, Go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 46. Let's read it together here, uh, starting in verse 29. And then we're going to go back and look at it, of course, more intimately. Notice it says, So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, because you are still alive. And then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's household who are with me in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation that you shall say your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for today. We look forward to what you have for us during this time. Lord, you've brought us here for a reason. And I ask now that you would open up our senses in the spirit, Lord, to receive everything you have. Lord, teach us by your spirit. Instruct us. I pray for fellowship uh, with you and with each other. And Lord, just the intimacy of your spirit now as you direct us. And truly, you told your followers that your Holy Spirit is the teacher and Lord, we now sit at your feet to hear what you would say to us. God, teach us. And Lord, even as we're going to see you settling the children of Israel in Goshen, Lord, settle us in Goshen. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled today, Settling in Goshen. And you know, there comes a time in our life when each of us need to learn to be able to settle in the land of Goshen. We're gonna see God settling the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. But there's also an application here that we really need to grab for ourselves because Goshen in Scripture, again, in this particular passage, was the best of the land of Egypt. And God desires for us as his followers to live in the best of the land, and that is in the blessings of the Lord. And yet how many of us live so many years unsettled in our Christian walk? I run across people on a regular basis that are just unsettled. I'm not talking about struggles. We all go through struggles. We all have the different things that we face as a, as a person, much less as a Christian. But again, I'm talking about more specifically, you know, just being settled in our walk with the Lord. And you know, I find that really the reason that most believers are unsettled in their walk with the Lord is they're not simply giving themselves completely to Him. And one of the things we're going to see in this uh, particular portion of settling in Goshen is learning what we need to do to turn everything over to the Lord so that we can walk in the blessing that God has for us. You know, the Bible says that we can grieve the Spirit of God. 
And what that means is, is that there are sometimes we're not walking in the fullness that God has for us. We're not walking in the land of Goshen, so to speak, if you will, and, and really receiving everything that God has for us because we've grieved his spirit. We're not in tune with him. We've done something that has caused him to, to have a distance between us. You know what it's like as a husband and wife or even between friends. When you have an argument, there's a distance there until that argument is settled. Until someone comes and gets it right and then it's all made you know, the way it should be. Now there's this relationship restored. I, I see a lot of Christians who live their life married to the Lord. They've, they've given their life to the Lord. They're settled with the Lord. But because of the struggles of sin or maybe just things they don't want to give up and turn everything over to the Lord, there's always this strained relationship. And it seems as though they're always unsettled in their walk with the Lord. And again, it, you know, it always seems to be those that from week to week to week are still struggling with something new each week. And again, I know we all struggle. But maybe some of you find yourself week to week, there's something new you're struggling in. And this whole Christian walk is such a battle. You're like, you know, when does this thing end? Now, I'm not going to say it ever ends. The struggle will continue until we're in the kingdom of God. We battle against, not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. So there's a spiritual battle that goes on. And then we have our own things that we battle against. But there should come a place in the Christian's life where we finally get settled. Yes, problems. Yes, struggles. All these things. But it's not so much a roller coaster. <laughs> you, know, you come to the Lord. I see people, they first come to the Lord. I think all of us got to have this roller coaster. You know, we're on a high. We're like, oh. Then we go back down. And we're screaming down. Ah, oh, we get scared again. Oh, we're back up. And then this whole thing's like, calm down. You know, be settled. And I think that's normal at the beginning. But that shouldn't last. We should get settled. We should be, you know, secure in where we are in the Lord. We should be uh, trusting in the Lord. We should have a regular walk with the Lord in his word and his prayer. And just again, that, that settled life. And so really, there's a picture here of God settling the children of Israel in Goshen. But there's also a picture for us, rather a, a literal picture here. But there's also a spiritual picture of us as believers being settled. Now, again, where we left off, uh, remember, uh, Joseph had been revealed to his brothers uh, he told them who he was, and he had sent them back to get their dad and to bring Jacob back down there. And he said, you know what? Two years of the famine are done. We have five years to go. It's going to get really ugly. I want to take care of you. God has sent me before you. He's laid the groundwork and done everything needed. He's put me in this powerful position. And now bring dad back, and we'll give you guys uh, living in Goshen, you know, your shepherds. And I'll uh, make an appeal to Pharaoh, and, and you make an appeal to Pharaoh. We'll get you in the land of Goshen, which was the best of the land. But it would make sense that they would be in the best of the land because they were shepherds. And we're going to see he instructs them to tell Pharaoh that so there's greater influence to get into Goshen. And why was Goshen the best of the land? Well, remember, especially during a famine, especially during a drought, Goshen was where all the river uh, outlets and inlets were that ran through the, the, the part of Egypt there uh, you know, to the Mediterranean. And so you had a very fertile area where it was well watered. And even if it wasn't watered because of the drought, you could pump the water over to your gardens. And they actually had what they called foot pumps that they would run from the rivers and they would pump them with their feet and make irrigation lines and run the water out of the rivers. And it was a very fertile area. I mean, if you, it, again, it would be the place to be in good times or in bad. And so that's where we left off with them getting ready to come down there. Uh, we saw in verse 28 that, that Jacob sent Judah on before him to point the way down to Goshen, to Goshen, to the land of Goshen. And now we take up in verse 29 where he finally arrives. And notice it says, So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel, and he presented himself to him. Now you can imagine what a great reunion this was. It had been over 20 years. A dad thinking his son was dead, a son thinking he would never see his dad again. Over 20 years have gone by, this great reunion. I can imagine he was, he was you know, loading up the chariot and heading out quick. You know, to go see dad, this would have been a very exciting moment for both of them. And notice what happens, and he fell on his neck, and he wept on his neck a good while. Again, no doubt. A great reunion doesn't give us great detail about what was going on, but you can imagine in your mind, I was trying to picture what this would have been like, the tears and just the amazement that you're seeing each other again, thinking you never would, and all the changes that had taken place in Jacob, all the changes that had taken place in Joseph, the way they looked, who they were. I mean, it was just an amazing event. And so there's this exciting reunion here that takes place with tears and joy. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I've seen your face because you're still alive. Now, again, he didn't want to just die. He wouldn't say, this is it, I'm ready, just kill me. But again, his point was, his heart was, you know what? I never dreamed I'd get the opportunity to be this fulfilled and see my son again. It's happened. I I've had enough. I'm ready. If the Lord takes me now, that's fine. Let's go. And so it's a great place to be there in the heart. There's a real settledness, interestingly enough, here now in the heart of Jacob that he's lived a full life and now he's got his captain off when he said, all these things are against me. And he found out, no, Jacob, all these things are for you. 
And now God has capped it off with giving you what you wanted more than anything. And you're, you're settled and you're in the land. And, and it's a beautiful picture again of them as a people being settled and back in the land. And so uh, this, again, beautiful scene here of, of him saying, you know, I'm, I could go now. Now what's interesting about that is, not only did he not go right then, God gives him another 17 years. And I find it interesting, it was 17 years old when Joseph would disappear and was gone. And he thought about losing all these years. I've lost my son. At 17 years old, I lost my son. At 17, now he gets back with his son and God gives him 17 more years with him. It's almost as if he's saying to him, you know what, I'm gonna make up all the years that you've lost. Although it was 20 some, there's something to me that was almost symbolic in the 17 years that God gave him in addition because now he gets to spend those years catching up with Joseph and getting to know Joseph as a man. And at the same time, not only that, he gets to see his grandkids through Joseph. You know, it's one thing to see Joseph, but to see the grandkids. And I know how you grandparents are. You know, if the kids move away, that's no big deal, but don't take the grandkids. And so now he gets to have the grandkids for all these years, right? And so this is an amazing thing that God has done, and it's exciting to see the Lord be faithful here. But this is something I want you to grab uh, as one of the first things we take note of, and that is this. Whenever you go through suffering for the Lord's sake, like Jacob had, whether it's for the Lord's sake in ministry or whether it's simply for maturity purposes. God needed to grow Jacob. He needed to mature him and do a work in his life. Whenever God sends you through those times where you feel that everything is lost and, and you've missed out on so much and life has done you wrong or whatever the case might be, rest assured God will give you that back and more when he's done. God will be faithful to reward you. And if not in this life, he will the next. But what I love about what Jesus told his followers, you know, Peter said, Lord, we've left all to follow you. What are we going to get? You got to love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord says, you know, I'm going to be you know, doing these things for people who love me. So what about those? We've left all that we have. He says, you're not only going to receive in the kingdom, you're going to receive down here, you know, hundredfold in blessing. And so that's how the Lord is. Again, it's not always financial. We know that. But it's in blessing in the Lord. So you can rest assured that when you go through those times, God's going to make it up. God will be a debtor to no man. And God wants to bless us. And so again, this, uh, I, you know, he's ready. I can do it. I can move on. I've seen you. And then Joseph said to his brothers in his father's household, now Joseph turns again and starts to begin to lay out what they need to do from this point on. He's giving them the, the plan, you know, as they're gonna be facing Pharaoh. He says, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me and the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock and they have brought their livestock or rather their flocks and their herds and all that they have so that it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now, it's interesting, in light of the scriptural types that we've been pointing out here, it's interesting that Egypt is a type of the world, as you know, and shepherds are a type of those who work among the flock of God. Yes, you could say more specifically the pastors, but I think it goes beyond that. Just believers in general, those who work among the flock of God, and you work among the flock of God as you serve and as you minister. And why do I find this interesting? Because notice this, it says here, every shepherd was an abomination to the Egyptians. And you know it's no different today, is it? Again, the world being a type of Egypt and us being a type of the believers, if you say you believe the Bible and you believe Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father and you make that public stand, they're gonna look at you and think you're crazy. You're going to be an abomination to the Egyptians. So don't be shocked by that when it happens. But rather realize this is part of, of, of what we're called to do. We're called to suffer for the sake of the Lord. I can promise you on the day we stand in the kingdom of God and it's revealed to all the world that the word of God is true and Jesus Christ is indeed the savior of the world, you're not going to be worried about it any. And yet it's amazing down here oftentimes how we worry, isn't it? Even in today, if you go out and you talk about God, because we live in a country that receives God to some degree, and there's a lot of believers in this nation. But again, you can talk about God, and you know what? You're not that much of an abomination in America because America was founded on godly principles. But even now in America, a nation that was founded on Jesus Christ and his word, if you get more specific than God and say, Jesus, now's when the problem begins. You can say God all you want. You get down to Jesus, now it becomes an abomination. So we understand that even in a nation that is honoring to God to some degree still yet, we understand what it's like to be an abomination to the world. But be encouraged. You know, they, there are those that have gone on before us and have been an abomination as well. And it's just part of being a believer. 
But notice also here that Joseph begins to make this plan with his family. We talked about that as they're moving down there, uh, moving into Goshen and getting ready to go see Pharaoh. He begins to make this plan. And there's a number of reasons here for this approach. One is they were shepherds and they had livestock and they would need really good pasture land. This is exactly where they needed to be. I mean, where do you go with, with flocks in, in a drought? You've got to go somewhere where something's growing or you can grow at least something. You've got to be around some level of water, some river system, some lake, or whatever. So the land of Goshen was the place for them to be. Secondly, note this, living in Goshen and far from the Egyptian people uh, would keep them separate. Now, let me make note of this. God's desire was to keep the children of Israel from being intermingled with the Egyptians and becoming like the Egyptians. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that God did not want them to influence the Egyptians. And you see, the picture is very clear for us as believers. The Bible says that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That is, when we walk with the Lord, we live in the land of Goshen, the land of plenty and richness and spirit in the Lord. But the world is all around us. We're right in the middle of it, but we don't become like Egypt. And the worst thing that could have ever happened to the children of Israel would be to go down there and to mingle in with Egypt and become just like the Egyptians. And you see, that is the danger of the church when it mingles too much in the world around us, becoming like the Egyptians and not being separate. Now, you know as a believer the balance. And that is, we are obviously to be separate in the sense that we don't mingle, but still at the same time, we are an influence in Egypt. And what I find interesting is that when the children of Israel came out some 400 years later, many of the Egyptians came with them. Why? Because they were an influence. They didn't intermingle, and, and, and really, in, in many ways, they did become like the Egyptians, actually. Over the years, as they began to become their slaves, they did intermingle, and they had many of the gods the Egyptians had, and it was difficult getting them out of there. But when they brought them out, many of the Egyptians came with them because they saw the God that the children of Israel worshipped and followed. And they said, I want that God. People should see that in their life. As we intermingle with Egypt, they should see, you know what? You're different. You know, where do you live? Goshen. <laughs> that is in spirit. What, why do you have this attitude? Why is it, you know, and we're human. We mess up and we do things. They know that. They don't expect perfection, but they see there's something different. And, and the world around us should see that. God wants them to see that. And yet at the same time, God specifically put them over in a place by themselves so they wouldn't be too intermingled with the Egyptians. And sadly, over time, they began to become more intermingled with the Egyptians and began to become more like them. And that's something we need to guard ourselves against. But you can see why God did it. But notice, lastly, God wanted them to be here again because God wanted to provide for them in a special way. And that's what God wants to do for us as well, to provide for us in a special way. You know, even when everyone else around them was languishing, you know, and all the fears that the world had to bring. It's interesting. Today, we live in a world where there's a lot of fears, aren't there? New diseases, uh, problems, storms, uh, new threats of war and, and, and rumors of war and, and, and nations turning against each other and, and tensions in the Middle East and all these things that are happening. But at the same time, in the midst of it, we live in this, this protected place where God says, trust me, because I've got everything taken care of. It's almost like this protected land of Goshen with the whole world around us falling apart. And yes, we're in the midst of it, but we have rest and we're settled. And we realize that though this whole world falls apart and goes completely crazy, we know what happens in the end, don't we? And we can rest that we're going to be with the Lord. We know that he's our protector. Now, from this point on, and really in this first little portion here, uh, as we finish these last few verses and the first few here in chapter 47, we're going to see several types of Christ here in Joseph. Remember, we talked about the types of Christ that we see in Joseph in this, in this passage here. And we're going to see several of them. The first of which really we see here at the end of chapter 46. And notice this, Joseph began to instruct his brothers and to teach them how they should act and speak before Pharaoh. And what do I mean? How is that a type of Christ? Because guys, if we're going to go and approach the throne of God and we're going to be acceptable to God, we need to understand what God expects from us from his word. And so even as Joseph taught them, now when you go to Pharaoh, this is what I want you to do. Jesus says to us, look, when you go before the father, here's what you need to know. And we find it in the word of God. We talked about grieving the spirit of God earlier. How do we grieve his spirit? By, by not living the way God wants us to live. So as we read the Bible, as we're instructed by the Holy Spirit, as the Lord instructs us, then we know now how to approach the Father. We know what's acceptable to him. We know what will keep us close to him and not, not far away from him. And so we see this whole instructing here of Joseph and his brothers of the proper way to approach the king on the throne, if you will. And so we're gonna see they follow his instruction and because of that, they're able to draw near. Notice verse 40, chapter 47, rather verse one. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. 
and indeed they are in the land of Goshen. Now again, notice we come to the next way that Joseph is a type of Christ. And notice this, Joseph was a mediator or a go-between for his brothers and the king on the throne. And that's exactly what the Bible says Jesus is to us. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You see, if you want to get to the king on the throne, you've got to go through Jesus. If they wanted to get to Pharaoh, they had to go through Joseph. There was no other way to do it. And if we want to get to the king on the throne, we have to go through Jesus. There's no other way. You know, people ask me sometimes, is there really, is there any other way to God? And you've heard the expression, all roads lead to God. That's true. All roads do lead to God, but not how you're thinking right now. The Bible says that all men will one day stand before God, which means whatever road you're on, you're going to end up in front of him one day. But there's only one road that leads into the kingdom of God. And that road is Jesus Christ through his son. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven or earth by which a man can be saved except through Christ Jesus. And so we have to understand if we want to get to the throne, if we want to get to the king, there's only one way. It's through our one mediator. And Joseph and his brothers, they only had one mediator to get them to Pharaoh. There was no other way. Think about it. They, they couldn't get to Pharaoh any other way. There's no way they could have you know, gotten to Pharaoh had it not been through uh, Joseph. And so uh, we see this whole picture here of Jesus and what he means to us and to the Father. And notice it says here, and he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Now this blows me away, and this didn't really hit me until this morning, really right before the service. But grasp what's going on. As I begin to imagine this whole scene in my mind, as you know, I like to live these things out. Here's Joseph in all of his pomp and circumstance, wearing the finest clothes of Egypt. He's got on the designer clothes. He's the number two man in all the world, arguably, and the number two man in Egypt for sure. He's wearing the finest clothes, living in the finest palace, and now his brothers show up. What's their situation like? Well, what would it be like for you living in the wilderness, taking care of sheep? They lived in tents. They had rags for clothes, so to speak, dirty, torn, smelly. They couldn't bathe on a regular basis. And again, it wouldn't be expected living out there. When you did bathe, the moment you were done, you'd be dirty again from all the blowing dust and dirt and all the things. And it was a famine. It was even more dry than normal. And what amazes me about this is we see that Joseph goes to his brothers and he sees them like that. Now, my tendency would have been, you know what, uh, guys, you know, why don't we, um, you know, let's get cleaned up a little bit. Now, he did give them some change of clothes. No doubt they wore something a little bit nicer. But at the same time, realize that they're, they're shepherds. And, and he's going to present them now to the king, and, and he comes in and I'm thinking, you know what? I think that if it was my brothers and you were there, you know, you might be tempted to be a little bit ashamed or a little bit of embarrassed. Well, here's what I love about Joseph. Joseph went to Pharaoh and he got these stinky, you know, dirty uh, uh, sheep herders who lived in tents and had, you know, rags for clothes almost. And he brought them before the king and he said, you know what? These are my brothers. And there's no sign in scripture that he was ashamed to call them his brother. You know what? That reminds me of the Lord when it comes to us. Because here's the Lord in all of his splendor and all of his glory and all of his beauty in the kingdom. And here we are in these filthy rags of sin and betrayal and rebellion against the Lord, saved only by his blood. You know, and as I say, getting in smoking, so to speak. And you know what? He points to us before the Father and says, these are my brothers, and he's not ashamed to do it. Isn't that amazing? Well, our time at the table of God's word has come to a close for today. But what are some things you gained from what you heard? The book of Genesis gets the ball rolling, causing you to think about all kinds of big picture questions, things related to the creation of the world, why God would allow a worldwide flood, and why were the Israelites his chosen people? These are all good things to think about and to dig further in God's word. But our hope is that what you heard today has helped solidify some things that might have been in question before. God was specific in how he brought things about. None of it was accidental or haphazard. As you listen through this series, we trust that you'll come to some great realizations about who God is and what he's done and is doing. To listen to this message again or share with a friend, go to thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net. Simply click on the Come to the Table tab. If you have some questions about what you heard today, we'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link on our website or call us at 865-609-1385. That's 865-609-1385. 
please don't hesitate to reach out. We encourage you to stay grounded in God's Word, allowing Jesus to grow you and draw you closer to Him daily, being willing to go where He's guiding you. Pastor Mark has prepared another teaching here in the book of Genesis. So join us again the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.